outline is really a crash course on while holding. And that's what we have often said, supporting the knife attack. And we hear this speech for years I've made about the panther taking down its game. He just doesn't use one claw. The panther uses all the muscles in its entire body. And that's what we're trying to do here when we support the knife. Yes, you elbow strike. Yes, you, you uh, hand strike and kick and knee and do all these other things along with the knife. And knife becomes uh, confusing because uh, people just duel with it. But there are times when you can take a shot, you should take that shot. And that's what this level is all about, is trying to organize that. And so there are less than lethal knife methods, which we'll take a look at. Sometimes holding a knife, and that's a fist. With, with protection inside to, to solidify it, you can strike with it, and it's a less than lethal attack. And we'll be doing some of those. But, and then of course, all the I have said in the prior level, uh, you really need a good solid unarmed combatives course in everything through life to add the stick to, to add the gun to, to add the knife to. So we're gonna take a look at, while holding a knife, punching, kicking, etc. go through that. And then of course, this is the level also of the pummel strike which is also less than lethal. And I learned from uh, Ben Mangles at South African Commando, uh, ways of how important it is to pummel strike a person first, and then maybe the, your first uh, movement with a folder is um, you can't open it up. And so you have to hit with it like a palm stick, whether it be a fist a, 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 with, protect, with power inside, not quite a brass knuckle, but the top and bottom and so forth. We said last level, the your folding knife should protrude a bit on the top and bottom for just those moments. So you can pull that knife out and fight and never open it. It's a less than lethal break your hand. And then we, this is the level we just introduce this issue of body elasticity uh, through that dodge and evasion drill. And it's a, a very important. I don't want you to become a, a circus freak, you know, double jointed circus freak. I'm just telling you that you need to be agile and you be, need to be able to move uh, to escape knife slashes and knife attacks and strikes also, you know. And then of course we discuss a stop one of the stop six in more of a detail and then the H, the first, the, the W's in H, the first W, who of the who, what, where, when, how, and why. And many people have, uh, there are syndromes about this, and if you look at my uh, uh, blog page and so forth, there are people who are way, they think they're better than they are, usually that's young people. And when you're older, you think you're less than you are. Uh, and it's just a common syndrome names, and they have psychological terms for them. But it's important for us to, who are we really, that we're gonna be out here engaging in fights and so forth. And, What's our conditioning, that kind of stuff, you know. So who are you and who do you think you're going to be fighting? And then uh, uh, who are you to be carrying a knife since this is the knife course? Think about that. Who are you to be carrying a knife? What country do you live in? I know people in Australia and England, it's like a death penalty if you have a knife over there. However, they still, have neck, they still carry neck knives. And I know police that travel overseas all over the world and they don't care if they get caught with a knife. They're gonna protect their life. So if you can articulate that for yourself, that's fine. But you ask yourself that question, who are you to be carrying a knife? And hopefully you'll come to some logical con you know, conclusions to that. Um, who else carries knives that you'll possibly be dealing with in the where and what of your life? Who do you think you'll be fighting? And uh, why would they have a knife? Who are they? We live in that culture now where we have to expect that, but some places not necessarily. You know. um, and then back to who is it that will be judging your actions? Level one, we discussed the, the uh, reasonable and prudent person, a, a judge, the totality of circumstances, the Supreme Court judge, and then of course the dumbest juror that I like to bring up too. They, these people have your fate in, in their hands when you take action with a knife or certainly with a gun. And stop one is uh, all that space up to stop two. It almost could be nose to nose. But remember that trouble walks. Trouble walks up to you and you walk up to trouble. And essentially, if you want to be comprehensive, stop one goes all the way back to sniper range, really. You know, that's how far it could go. That's why it's compatible to so many training ideas and systems. 
But uh, you have to be aware of uh, the fact that you could be walking up to a supermarket and uh, it could be being robbed. Or you could be walk, walk inside one or trouble walks up to you and you walk up to trouble. I, we suggest that um, you try, we are, we are students of the unusual and uh, we just mentally that way. And if you're somewhat awake, you do spot the odd or unusual thing. The, in the military, they discuss the bush that doesn't go in the right direction during a, 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 a slow breeze that goes by, you know. And that's, we'll spot things that are weird. If one guy had one shoe on and one guy and the other foot barefoot, you'd probably spot that pretty eventually. Let that happen because that's a, a great indicator to unusual things. And um, you uh, walk up to uh, a store, what is it usually like? And then imagine if, if it was being robbed. You know, with, with, what would the traffic look like? Look inside at the people in the, the heads, just casually. But try to make yourself anyway alert to being that capable of reading and looking around and trying to discuss, trying to figure out what's happening around you. Um, positioning occurs in stop one. And that is uh, you positioning yourself to the door to get away. Or you positioning yourself to turn your weapon side sideways to maybe pull a weapon out. Uh, positioning yourself to the lamp that's on the table. He's positioning you probably also. It could be, you know. Positioning yourself for more witnesses to see what's happening. Positioning is a big deal, you know. And certainly in stop one. Uh, don't get too close, as they say, because you want to get hit with a sucker punch or something. But I just want to say real quickly that... Um, don't underestimate how fast someone can lunge at you. I just want to leave you with that thought on this subject because people can close space unbelievably when they get angry and jump. And you think you're okay, but you're probably not. And you mess around in the martial world, you begin to realize just how fast someone can close in on you. But anyway, uh, that's a kind of a discussion on positioning. And uh, real briefly, everybody needs to get a stance when you're in a trouble situation whatever that is. I used to teach one or two at the police academies and stuff, and then I got to realize, who am I to tell you how to stand? Uh, it, it, we, we, are li we live in that mixed person's world, and you need to decide what, how best you're going to react. We have this quick list, it's in the outlines and in all our books, but uh, some people who are about to get into a fight uh, stand, have their hands down. But you know how fast someone could snap out of you from this position. This is not necessarily a safe position. But at the same time, if you develop this, you could use this too. And he's not necessarily alert to someone. You know, the difference between this, you know, and then there's some of these other positions. But hands down is not a, a, a free pass for someone who's uh, giving you a hard, hard time in front of you. I always say watch out for the arm swinger. The classic sucker punches are in, hidden inside the torso twist and the arm swing, as well as the weapon draw. Uh, so you can, if you're gonna plan to do something, you could kind of move around in an animated way and conceal a lot of things by, by doing this. The intellectual, they used to call it the, the Jack Benny pose, but no one knows who Jack Benny is anymore. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the, this is your hands are up. To me, I find it presumptuous, unless someone has a beard or a mustache. And some people can get away with it very easily. And then some, on a natural level, it looks unusual, you know? And that's not a good, that's not a good thing. Uh, the, um, the, the thinker, you know, uh, is that person who breaks that conversation and, and sort of looks, looks away. They used to call it the 100-yard stare. Now it's the 1,000-yard stare. They keep adding distance to it. But um, suddenly that's a, a recognizable thing that the communication may be over. Unless he's, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, doing something like that looking down, but that's thinking, maybe not thinking about what's going on. But you could use these things for yourself. Billy Jack would do that. <laughs> you know, he'd break away from what's happening. The animated hand guys, years ago we, would, we were free to say it's the Italiano method of communication. But it's probably not good, you just have to say animated hands. Just like in kickboxing, the motion of the hands offer deception for a strike. It's the same thing when you're discussing things and your hands are moving around and it gives, 
you the freedom uh, to have moving hands and strike in different or grab out in different places. And th there's the pointer guy. He may be pointing at you, but this is also the setup for many sucker punches. That you start looking at that finger, the pointer. And then, of course, the people you'll get in front of sometimes, they, they, they strike a fighting stance. This is not good. Or you may do it to scare somebody off, too. There's that fighting stance. And then uh, many have the uh, cross arms. Uh, the, I suggest that you don't have this bow tie where you could be, your arms could be pinned and captured, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, we always used to show something a lot looser than that. This is a very innocuous thing if the New York Times news reporters are coming by and they look at you and it's different than this, you know, this, as opposed to this, but I can block, I can shove, I can push, I can pull a weapon very quickly from this position. And it's very popular. This is something to think about. But I would like for you to come up with your own. Use this as an inspiration or something, but it's situational. Come up with something. I, I worked with a guy, I told you many times, he just would just hang his thumbs on his belt buckle, his gun belt buckle. This was a fighting stance for him because he practiced it. Yet, he could get very close to people and talk to them, but he was ready. So in that sense of deception, you know, it's what a fighting stance in your mind and what you train to fight from, from there, you know, is uh, the, the, the thing to do. So customize it if possible. War and stop one is the time for uh, assessing that opponent. You may do this. Uh, it's deceptive. How big, how strong do they look? How fast do they look? I remember one time a guy was uh, schizophrenic, no doubt, uh, screaming and cursing in a park. A lot of kids and their parents there, they call the police. And so uh, I walk up to him. He says, I know why you're here. You know, this is a free country. I can say anything I want. I have the First Amendment right to free speech. If I want to curse, I can curse. I can, do you run track or something? I can say, see, he's, he's an idiot, but he's uh, thinking, what's this fight going to be like? Uh, uh, he's uh, thinking I'm a runner or an athlete. And in the middle of his ranting, that there's no... Uh, um, borders in his mind, you know, in the middle of his ranting, he's asking about my physical condition. Well, people are thinking this too, but he was nuts enough to say all these things out loud. You know, I beat him up and arrested him. But anyway, <laughs> the, the uh, what is your opponent going to look like? And you, you try to make these assessments quickly, real quickly. I always look for pants on a, a guy I was going to arrest. This is a, a, a belt buckle. A, belt, a, a, a pants, a belt. I always look for this belt because that's a great handle in a fight on the ground or standing. So I was used to see what's, how long is their hair? Do they have a beard? Um, do they have a belt? Because I might be able to use that late, later. And then of course you can't help but assess you know, how, what kind of a, a, a fight this might be from that guy. But I've been beaten up by many small people. So don't let that dissuade you into size being a big deal. <laughs> you know, yeah, nothing worse than an airborne guy. <laughs> Even if he's 120 pounds, he's still <laughs> airborne. Hit your head. <laughs> so, uh, but that's the things that happen in stop one. And of course, the, the, a big problem is the sucker punch in stop one. These are things from a distance. We get stuck out here in this showdown range. And all the tricks, and that's in level five of our unarmed course, is a little study on sucker punches. But you have to be aware of it. Then another stop one issue is verbal skills. And um, there's no magic cure for that. You're either a good comedian, or you're a good talker, or you're not in many ways. And uh, go to a, a Second City Comedy School and learn how to ad lib. But because you can get off script and save yourself out of many jams. And so there's no, now calm down, sir, no set rules that you can use to, to make somebody uh, shut up. And uh, you should be able, in the subject of the verbal skills, is to recognize when the verbal is over. You know, and that is that stare, that look away. Um, the disconnect and what he's saying if he's not listening to you then that's another problem that escal escalates the, the situation but um, you have to uh, uh, get a style you know that we talk about so often in other courses but get a style of speech get a, get this uh, get your own uh, 
ad living skills and try to deal with it. As you know, in, in Starbucks, if you get hired, you go to a confrontation school classes where uh, they try to solve 70 or 60 or 70 of the most common verbal confrontations with customers in a store. And so, I mean, what could that be? My coffee's too cold, uh, this is too crowded. I don't know what it is, but there's 70 of them, 60 or 70 of them. And you were taught how to solve that pro uh, relation with the customer, you know? And uh, wow, how come cops don't have that? You know, but, but here's domestic disturbance, the top 40 things that they tell you. Here's this one, the top 30. Why don't we get that, you know? Uh, but Starbucks does. As, as Steve McQueen said in the Towering Inferno, that's because they don't pay to watch us play. And they don't uh, pay, pay for our coffee, and we don't have a lot of money to do that. But that's how you could organize your life and try to you know, do things in terms of uh, verbal problems. Uh, at times, of course, too, uh, silence is golden. Don't say anything. It, it, it often confuses that other person. And that uh, uh, another old classic trick is if you're going to preemptively strike someone and stop one, <clears throat> do it in the middle of when he's talking or do it in the middle of your talking. There's just, a, they claim an edge to doing it. So, you're typically speaking, Mr. I'm sick of your crap. One, two, three, punch. As opposed to, Mr. I'm sick of your crap, I am really punch. And vice versa, you know, he may do that to you as a sucker punch, but it's just an old school thing about <clears throat> using, uh, taking advantage of your verbal skills. Remember, stop one, you, you can often retreat to. And if it's a knife fight, if you can push off from two and three and four and five and get back, and he's got a knife, you have a knife, why are you staying there? Is, it, uh, is he odd job in uh, Fort Knox and the atomic bomb is ticking and you've got to you know, save all the gold in America? I mean, why, are you, why do you have to go through this guy? Why? What's going on? You know, and so you always have that orderly retreat possibility as a citizen. Maybe not so much in, in if you're a super spy, you know, or a cop or something. You got to stop stop odd job. The uh, and I like to also in this area break things down to two particular problems. You have now, I, this overused term, but they're using it everywhere. Bully, where someone gets really close to you and uh, they're going to attack you from here. Or they're yelling at you. And then there's the mad rush attack, where someone just runs at you like a lunatic screaming. These are the two common problems in stop one. And I really like for people, so in other words, if, you teach, if you're having somebody throw a punch at you, they're in the, the close-up bully mood, and they throw the punch. Or you have somebody back here, ah! punching you like that. That's the mad rush. You need to work on both of those. Our list of He's not supposed to move, and I'm not supposed to move. So if I'm the trainer and I move in on him, the trainer backs up. That's not what this is about. We're supposed to isolate body dodging, body evasion. And so I'm just going to take this and, sl and slash it in his head horizontally and horizontally. Now you have a duck, you have a chin pull, you have a bob and weave. I don't care which one you do. The, the, the key is save your head. But the thing is that in your classes, when you have time, maybe you should make them do 15 ducks, 15 chin pulls, you know, uh, uh, 15 bob and weaves, and then eventually they get to pick what they're gonna do uh, that's more comfortable for them. But that's classroom work. And so for starters, the trainer, he can't move, you know, is uh, you take, he saves his head and he saves his head. You know, ducking is great in boxing unless you're six foot five. You know, uh, the, the duck is difficult, uh, but if the pe people are the same height or whatever, then, you, then the duck is a feasible move. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, save your head and save your head. The, and we're going to add the next part just to save, save our time, is I'm going to slash his stomach. And usually that hula hoop motion of quickly getting out of the way, this is the word, the key word, ambush. You're up against someone and suddenly somebody takes a swing at you and it's God motion, you know. You're just reacting quickly. So you save your head, save your head, save your stomach, and save your stomach. 
Let's just do we that. We did head, head, stomach, stomach. That leg is forward. That's kind of one of the premises is the person's in a bladed position for you. So I saw this in the Philippines the first time. They said, uh, no, it's no put work. You do not move your feet. Okay, so we're not moving our feet. So then they take a swing at your knee or thigh and you move your foot. So I said, well, I thought there wasn't supposed to be any footwork in this. But this one is, oh, okay, now there is a Filipino version where when this comes toward your uh, leg like this, incoming, you create a V and it passes by and it comes back. When the return one comes, you have a tendency to put your, it's very uh, unnatural feeling to start turning your knee toward the strike. And so I'm an advocate of, because you would have to, Turn again. I'm an advocate of stepping out and stepping in, which is you know the center of the clock, and that's four o'clock and two o'clock, and you're just stepping out and stepping in to save. So save your head, save your stomach, and save your knee as it comes. Now, to hold the knife because this is the knife course. When we do this with a stick course, I often let the person hold the stick, but the propensity to strike and use that weapon. Uh, you, it's almost irresistible and it kind, of, it kind of destroys the drill because the drill is supposed to create flexibility. But flex, flexibility combined with while holding is a good thing. And uh, just right here, I'll take the time to talk about the, the great uh, tennis study that they did where they ran some tennis uh, athletes through an obstacle course and, the, and the, the first run through, the guys uh, and gals, a couple of women, held the tennis racket and they jumped and they did the whole obstacle course and they were done. Then they come around again, had some Gatorade, put the tennis racket in their left hand. They ran the obstacle course. They did worse. And then for the third time, now usually anybody that's ever run any police or military obstacle courses, the, the second or third or fourth time, you're kind of getting the hang of it. You know that's difficult, this is hard, you're kind of getting the hang of it. These people then did the obstacle course with nothing in their hands, and they did even worse. So the problem is, is uh, we become glued to that uh, tool or weapon in our hand, and it becomes part and parcel of the performance, you know. And so when I saw this study, I said, well, what does this mean to the stick fighter, or the knife fighter, or the cop holding a baton, or fighting with, her, with a pistol? They're probably not going to punch as hard and fight and kick as hard where they're holding these weapons in their hand. And that's the, the classic test. And it's on my um, blog pages, uh, the, the study. It's, it's kind of old now. But it was fascinating. And now, in other words, a tennis player, you know, that is a righty, his Achilles tendon performs better when he's got a racket in his hand. And when you take it away, he, he's not as good an athlete. And so we have that in reverse, because we're always training empty-handed. We put something in our hand, we don't hit as hard. We don't strike as hard, etc. And so that's why it's not a bad idea for him to dodge while holding that knife. And later, when we get into crossing blades, level seven, the dueling scenario, is uh, I will take a slash in his stomach. He saves his stomach and slashes back. See, you play this by the, kind of by the numbers. And so that you dodge and attack. And, but this is just level two, and I'm trying to build something here very slowly. <laughs> As opposed to jumping in a seminar and jumping right to other material. And so he can, from now, you can hold the knife or not. But it's not a bad idea. Just restrain from hitting me. That will come later. We will do this later. The block, the strike, uh, is supported by the physical evasion. You know, and what we're doing is isolated training. We're isolating, you know, the evasion and then isolating the strike and putting them together. You know why this year the football season is over? It's terrible sports for me right now. The vacuum on a Sunday. This last, these last two years, an incredible amount of one-handed catches. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. It's been unbelievable. An incredible amount. They're in the end zone catching touchdowns with one hand. And you suddenly say, well, we have just grown these athletes genetically to making incredible one-hand catches. What has happened is, in training, now the coaches have sent you the, runner, the receiver out and told you, you're going to catch 25 passes only with your left hand. 
He runs. He tries. He fails. Oh, he got that one. Then he comes back. You're going to run 25 patterns and only catch with your right hand. Same situation happens. Suddenly, these guys start catching one-handed. But the purpose is, the last 25 patterns is to catch with both hands. So what are they doing? They're isolating the right hand in a series. They're isolating the left hand in a series to build the two-handed catch together. And that's it. I mean, this is what it is. If you want some good training ideas, look at football, what the new guys, the new physical trainers are doing in football and, and, and high-performance sports. And in there is a key, you know, to unlocking fantastic training and, and, and advancements. They're the ones doing it, not us, you know. So, he can hold a knife if he wants to. It's not a bad idea. Just hesitate from using it too early. We're going to do that later. So here you have the head slash, the head slash, the stomach slash, the stomach slash, the knee, and the knee. Now, uh, I, I started adding stuff from here. Uh, the, the up and down, you know, which you can turn sideways to avoid. And so there's a slash up. He comes back. Because each one of these is an isolated ambush attack. He's, and I slash down. And so we have just added that. It's head, head, stomach, stomach, knee, knee, up, and down. Uh, and then we have two stabs. And like I said, I've added this because I thought that the beginning was not complete enough. Since the knife has come down from the stab, you're low. It seems to be common sense that it would come in this way. And so what you could do is you could hollow out suddenly. You know, because we're not moving, we're just trying to work the body. You could suddenly hollow out or twist it or go to the side. Remember, if the trainer starts to move in on you, then the trainee starts to move back. That's later. This is to make you move, you know. And as the more you do, get a little closer to the person. Cut some buttons on the shirt, you know. And if you see you can enhance that person his ability to, to slip out of the way. And so here's this stomach stab, which he dodges. Be careful of your friend's eyes. Everyone, you know, should have uh, eye protection on, really throughout life, you know. Uh, <laughs> even during sex, have eye protection. <laughs> but here is his shot to the head, which, which he dodges. And so the total set is we, he saves his head, he saves his head. He saves his stomach, he saves his stomach. He saves his knee and back, he saves his knee and back. You slash up, you slash down, stomach, and then head. Just watch your friend's eyes as you're coming in. And so that's the big 10. You know, I'm, I'm addicted to the clock. However, that I'm not, I'm, I use this. And I use it in everything. And if I wanted to, I could say, well, this is 2 o'clock to 10 o'clock. But that's really, think makes people want to do an X. And, and 3 o'clock, I could turn into the clock, but I don't. I just use this because I, I believe in it uh, so much. If you say 2 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, if you say head, belly, knee, everybody gets it. Everybody remembers it remarkably. And if you teach it in this progression, start the head, add the belly, head, belly, then the knee, everybody gets it instead of some obscure drill everyone is struggling with. So this is the piece. He's on the ground. The, the body motions that rescue him now are not evident. You know, what you just did standing, you're probably not going to be able to do here. But it's just a good thing to experience also uh, this grand maneuvering. And so he's got to save his head. And this like, the first time is going to be bad for him. You know? But he, try, he saves his head. He saves his head. He saves his stomach. He saves his stomach. He saves that leg. He saves that leg. Later we'll be blocking with our shoes and stuff. But level two is just teaching him how to evade is all it is. Here comes this rip up center line. Here's the rip down the center line. There's the stomach stab. Watch your friend's eyes and then the head stab. Just to get him moving. Let's see if we can now in a bear hug. You know, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, collecting money for the mob, but who knows. <laughs> And, uh, and so what he has got to do that is really accentuate the evasion movements to save himself. And this is a good time to do it. You know, so watch this here. I go for his head. He saves his head. He saves his head. Watch this one. He saves his stomach. And he saves his stomach. He saves his leg. And he saves his leg. Here comes the upward slash he's got to turn out of. 
sometimes I catch my, my collection partner's hand when I <laughs> and, and maybe he tries to do that. <laughs> then here comes the stomach stab. Get out of the way. And then watch everybody's eyes. But you have this shot here. And so usually when you're the pinned person, now you know we call this while holding, because we're holding the knife. This is while held. So if you ever in our unarmed course, if we're doing kicks, you have to do all the kicks in the program while held. So you're doing a snap kick while somebody's holding you. And just so that you get the feel of that, because it's possible. And of course you have to do all the kicks on the ground. And that's just the way that operates. So hey, uh, also just as an aside, if you want to, in the end of the, you know, the guy's gonna be, when we do this in the unarmed course, he's punching at us, he's swinging a stick at us. But uh, at the end of the, of the 10 moves, you, you can always escape from this position, you know. You have the classic, the foot stomp. If you want more arm space, if I did a, a curl, and I've had some pretty strong guys try to stop me from doing this, but it's difficult to do. If I drop my body weight and do a curl, I suddenly have more arm space to do stuff, you know. You have all your favorite escape rear bear hug uh, drills, but it's a good way. You have the, the, the King Kong on the knuckles here. You know, and which sometimes <laughs> expose a finger and you bend a finger. It's just chest pounding, except you're trying to attack the back of the hand. All those <laughs> tricks that you can do. Uh, but anyway, when you're stuck in here, you've done, you've done all the dodging. I like for people to escape. And uh, you escape with your favorite bear hugs. Yeah. Now, this is not level two. So This is not level two. This appears a little bit later as we progress. But I know you're all dying to do it. So we'll, we'll, we'll just do it now. But it's not official level two. He gives me that slash to the head. I, I, I'm invading. I'm doing everything that I did pretty much. And I, I get to hit here. He gives me the back hand. I get to hit here. Here comes the stomach. I hit here. As a, you see what I'm doing as opposed to this. You can hit if you don't make some people move a bit, they're just going to be like dullards. So, uh, he gives me the head. I, I'm stepping out of the way, hitting, hitting, hitting. I would probably save the leg. I'm, here comes the uppercut's last pow. The down, ah, the stomach shot, mm, the head shot. Mm. All that motion, this is just a way to officially put it and get it in doctrine. I would Mohammed Ali stand. We'll take a look at this uh, <clears throat> using this as sort of like a palm stick. So here's a hooking strike from 12 o'clock or anything from above. This hand is up ready to do something. Here's a hooking strike from the right side or anything from you know 12 o'clock to, to 5 o'clock. Here's a hooking strike uh, from the uh, anything from below using the top side of the hand and a hook here using the top side of the hand. We'll switch hands. We have a hook from 12, top side, hook from 3, a hook from 6, and a hook from 9. We have now just used the top of the hand to strike, 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 strike. The top of the hand, strike, 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 strike with hooks. Top of the hand, this time with a thrust. We thrust at 12 o'clock, thrust at 3 o'clock, thrust at 6 o'clock, thrust at 9 o'clock. We switch hands, 12, 3, 6 o'clock, and then 9 o'clock. Uh, we, we've done the top side. Here's the bottom side of this. Here's a hook at 12, or anything from above. A hook at 3, anything from this side. A hook at 6, and a hook at 9 o'clock. We switch hands, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and then 9 o'clock. And so we'll have to take a look now at a thrust from the bottom side. We thrust at 3, we thrust at the 3 o'clock side, you thrust low, at six, and we thrust. We'll switch hands. We have 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, and then nine o'clock. <clears throat> he has that knife in his hand. So what I'm just going to ask you to do is let him punch with it. There's that jab. There's the jab cross. You know. There's the jab to cross and the hook. You know, they just kind of filter through and just punch a little bit. Maybe switch leads so that, and just remember where that feet, if I feet, there's the uppercut. Oh, you know, there's that uppercut. Maybe that's the descending overhand. You see the feet for that? You know, uh, bring out the brass knuckle five with folks. You could do this alone. 
You don't need a partner for it. I think everyone here has a folding knife, so that's correct. So I'm here in this position, right? I throw this jab, and then I open the knife. I throw jab, cross, I open up the knife. Jab, cross, hook, I open up the knife. This is good because this is like a grabbing knife in a way, the way this one is. Everyone's knife is going to be different. You know, my, my knife is ready. I jab and cross and hook and uppercut, and I open up the knife. And that last one, jab, cross, hook, uppercut, descending overhand, and I open up the knife. He is going to punch that, open the knife, and slash it. Or stab it, it doesn't really matter. Just keep in mind that with your gear, you have your gear and the metal knife, the training knife is going to slowly destroy your stuff. So just act accordingly. Buy a bunch of these at the used place you don't care about anymore, or hit carefully. Those who don't care. And hit them carefully because it will start to destroy it. But you get the idea, right? Now he has to, the jab is nothing. The jab, now he has the hook punch. He hits, opens, and slashes. And that's kind of the part of the life This sort of style was inspired to me in the 1980s from Larry Hartzell. You have a hook, and you have a hook, but you also have, you know, you know, that version. And uh, I, so you could do it this way. And just say, let me just pop back here. Then he's got, you have more leg room here, you know. Uh, he, he do this here. So he gets to operate in a little bit better space. And then we roll over to where we have the same kind of thing. And then you might have to hit, open up the knife. You know what I mean? Because we want to we get that opening in there. But just do basically the same thing. Open that knife up once in a while, too. But also important is the pummel strike that people use to stun other people. One of my uh, favorite old instructors is Ben Mangles, a former Rhodesian and South African commando. And uh, I went to numerous uh, <laughs> Training sessions with him, the pommel strike is a big deal. It's a knockout, a stunning knockout blow. Of course, you'll see various military knives that have sort of a Klingon end, like four spikes sticking out or something. And really, that you, you need your thumb on the on the top of this thing to perform tasks. And you know, remember our our drop and the ground and sometimes you're fighting you can't move in you push this here do a hundred yard dash in and if you have Klingon spikes or death devices up here you can't utilize the knife and so a good simple one is good um, if you just look at our outline we're now progressing to the support strikes which are less than lethal and all good knife systems God help you need less than lethal material I will testify for you that we have less than lethal material. <laughs> this is uh, how this might manifest. In our cro crossing blades dueling video and level, which, you know, the crossing blades is over there. In the crossing blades training, you, you there are things that fencers and duelers call, and stick fighters call lures, L-U-R-E-S. And open, open body is one, and gift hand, knife hand, gift hand, hand. I look stupid, he goes after that, I pull away and I get it. It's just a lure, you know. And so let's, that's out too far and he can't stand it. He takes a swipe at it and then you know where his knife end is and you try to do something. And so if he, if this, if he comes to take a swipe at I might be able to get an eye attack. It's just because this is closer and I, I can thrust my fingers in his eye. And that might be a time when you, the panther uses the rest of its body to take down game. And that's why we might need skills at eye attacks. So you can be in any knife stance you want to move around and just get an eye attack, no knife. Yeah. 
Kind of put it where, where eyes might be. But it's, again, the quest of while holding, as we said earlier. He, he won't punch as hard while holding an object. He might have a funky object while holding an object. And so this time, we're, we're practicing that he's doing that while holding. And so we have to work down this list. Let's get ten, and I'd like for you to switch hands. You know, so that you get the lefty too. And you can move around. And make him get an eye at that, whether he's got a saber or a reverse grip. Let's see what we can do. Here I am. This goes up. Boom. And he hits the palm. You can feed it in different places. Uh, but, you know, uh, you have to try to remember the practicality of what led you to, to not use the knife but the palm. What opening? And I just gave you an example of how it is. And so you maximize it yourself. So just, just get like 10 palm strikes, but move around now and, and make it challenging. Don't you see? Forearm in old karate, they would say it was just a big metal bar that was hard to hurt. So the forearm strike is through it. You know? And uh, if you're a little far out, it becomes a hammer. If you're a little far in, it's an elbow. So I like to start with that forearm for that reason. And uh, there you go. So kind of, there you go. Get that, develop that forearm strike while you're holding the knife. Just out, and then you hammer fist. And the, the, the question of distance is, uh, you know, if you're in close, that becomes a forearm strike. If you're in a little closer, maybe it's an elbow. Let's just get the punch. We've done enough punching. But there is a idea. One of the strikes in our system is a body bump. For, for this moment when you're, when you're uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good idea, you know, but when you decide to do it. And you may decide, for example, that uh, he's taking a big slash at your belly, Whoa! and you bump him out to say, get out of here, what are you crazy, something like that. But it's a, it's, a, it's a body bump, and I think it's a part of the arsenal that people should use. If you can have that, if you're doing the old who bad drill, you know, event one, one and a half. One, two, body bump. One, two, three, same thing, body bump. One, two, three, four, body bump. One, two, three, four, and he goes five, body bump. And you just, <laughs> when you crash on the ground, you body bump. You know, it's a, it's a, a whole different um, application, but throwing your weight around can be pretty darn good. And striking with the saber grip. And so you can, uh, he just hold, all I'm going to do is punch with the, the saber grip and then punch with the reverse grip and not engage the knife. And it's a less than lethal application. So you have the pummel strike, you have a hand strike like that, and with the saber grip, you can punch it like this. And it's for those times when you decide that you can't stab or slash someone which I hope is like 99.9% .9 of your life. <laughs> but uh, you make that decision, it's out, it's not working, he's not leaving, and there are less than lethal applications you can use with this knife. And of course, you know, less than lethal targets, cutting someone on the arm uh, and telling them to go fix it, you know. Uh, there are applications you can use that are less than lethal and articulated. Some of you remember. And now we have that kick. So he's got a knife, and I'm just looking for uh, the, the kicking while holding a knife. Remember there's maybe just five from the front leg, five from the rear leg, and then he switches leads. Five from the front leg, and that's right, and five, you know, that way. Just hey, so then, the other front leg. That's a marine line right there for you. <laughs> the other front leg. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, you get the idea because I want you to kick while holding a knife. I want you to kick while holding a stick. I want you to kick while holding a firearm, too. And that's the whole purpose of that. So we have to do it. So let's get like You can have the kick, boom, and a knife slice or stab. Just to keep both things on target and get them as fast. Then you might slash and then kick and then move around. But you can see the combination making, building the panther, building that, that panther. So now, I guess we'll just do a round. Boom, mm -hmm. so, while holding a knife. And since we've introduced that, we can get, the, get both of them in. Yeah, uh, 
Rear leg, remember the breakdown, you have a rear leg round kick, and then a front leg round kick from that side. You can do bo both. Uh, <clears throat> but we're just making someone do a kick. So here we have our hip, and then a knife. And so let's get both sides, bam, and then a knife. Bam, and then a knife. Let's see if we can knee. And the knife. Well, that would be a good move the title. The knee and the knife. And then the other side. And then the thrusting knee. Oh, oh, oh yeah, there you go. And the knife. Yeah. So you know, just the category of thrust kick. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to kick more. So, so you know where you, you don't do, you just leave yourself open because you thrust and then you hold that up and kick. Now the thing about the thrust kick is you should slash first and then kick because if you thrust him away, you can't do anything. You know. So you, we'll we'll strike first with the knife. The lead is often. Uh, a pop, just kind of get in like a regular fighting stance. Just switch legs so they can see it this way. That, that, that thrust can be a pop on the the thigh or the knee, but that this is supposed to be the door, the door kicker. It's that rear one. But you know, all SWAT guys and military guys now who are kicking doors do the mule kick from the back because they say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought I was going to Do you know I... Edit that, yeah. <laughs> in, Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, about 21 years ago, I knocked him cold on film. And uh, we were... Remember? He didn't sit down and we, And so, you know, we were being filmed for a Tactical Knife magazine, and uh, Barnard just grabbed his foot and pulled him off. And then we got the next guy. I said, next guy, next guy. <laughs> but, but seriously, the SWAT guys now and military guys are kicking doors with the back mule kick for more power. I guess there's more power. Uh, so anyway, we're going to slash and then thrust. The classic people, classical people will tell you, try to emphasize the thigh, of the heel as much as possible. You know, and, and that extent, with, almost with all kicking in, in classical terminology, they uh, like the side kick or the, you know the, the heel they prefer. But in, in combatives, it's your whole shoe, and they never differentiate that. But if you're going to get nitpicky, you know they, they want you to, to have the heel in the right position. Here, the whole purpose of this is to get people punching, and kicking, and hand striking, and use of the knife in the middle at all. As we progress uh, through the saber stab and the saber slash and all these different levels, uh, we will uh, continue to do that, you know, as, as well as on the ground. So we've got to this point. What I'm going to ask you to do now is shadow box with all of Just go ahead and shadow box. Imagine the enemy in front of you. Shadow and shadow box with them. Kill the enemy, spill his blood. When you stick your hand in the goo that was once your best friend's face, you'll know what to do. You can, you can shadow box uh, in front of someone, which is much more productive than your imagination. And uh, to make sure that it's safe, you can put a barrier down that he won't go past, and you can put a barrier down over here, whether you can stick or knife or otherwise. And these guys, you have a knife, you have knives uh, out. Uh, you can see reactions and movements and fakes and stuff like that, and you saw all that we've just done. And so we need a shadow box over the person. You do later, you know, in uh, level seven, we have crossing blades, which is knife dueling, and then we bring it on in, as they said, closer and you start knife sparring. But this is only level two, we're building, officially building. Everybody's doing different levels at different times, and I don't care about that at all. But as a, as a doctrine person, I've got to prepare it officially in order, and this is the ways that I do.
is really a continuation and a finish up of knife one. We can't squeeze everything in in a perfect topic in knife one, so it kind of continues in this one. Issues like uh, the inability to open the folder and some more things that you can do with it to the point where you just open the folder. And then also utilizing the pummel strike. And in this, uh, we also discuss um, a continuation of the stop six and a continuation of the who, what, where, when, how, and why. But here are the nine ready positions. There are three standing. That's knife forward, knife neutral, and knife back with the sacred grip. You know, we've discussed this before, that uh, uh, I'm not a fan of dueling knife back because the opponent will just cut this to ribbons. Just spar it out and you'll see what I say. But if he's stupid and I'm stupid and we're both knife back, it's King's X. He's wasting a second, I'm wasting a second, etc. But nonetheless, you will probably be transitioning through all of this footwork anyway. There are three, knife forward, knife neutral, and knife back. When you are knee high, for whatever reason that has happened, you fight people who are over you, you fight people who are equal to you, and you fight people who are under you. This is essentially the top side of a knife ground fight. This knee may be up, both knees may be down, this knee may be up. You may post with your palm, post with your fist, post with your forearm, even post with your shoulder, if that's what happens. But you will execute all these solo command and mastery moves from this position. And then the final three is I'm on the ground. And so we are here uh, fighting someone, this full spectrum, flat on our back from all the way up to all the way down. Then we are fighting someone on the left side, this full spectrum, not just someone right here, but where this ended when you were on your back. This full spectrum from here to here, and then you are fighting here, this full spectrum from here to here on this side. And so those are the, the big uh, knife ready fight positions what we want you to do when I show you the solo command and mastery, the stabs, uh, the pummel start, whatever it is, do them from all of these. Uh, if we make, if we do them on the film, it'll take forever. But do the solo command and mastery work, standing, kneeling, and on the ground, and from that bus stop, non-ready stance. There is a pummel strike from the reverse grip and a pummel strike from the saber grip. There's a thrusting version and a hooking version that we like to do through the big uh, positions, the nine ready, the one unready position. But uh, just for an example, if you have the saber grip and you do a thrusting pummel strike, you must be acutely aware of the fact that the knife is aimed back at you. Much like your reverse grip action, a charge, a simple charge or a crush against the wall can stick the point back in you. And this is true with a, a thrusting pummel strike from 12, a thrust at 3, a thrust at 9 o'clock, and a thrust at 9 o'clock. So when you do this, when you teach this, make sure that people are aware of this, pro this potential problem. Uh, here we'll have the left hand, we have a thrust at 12, a thrust at 3, a thrust at 6, and a thrust at 9 o'clock, the saber grip pummel strike. Then you have to do them on the, on the uh, advanced version of the clock, which is all 12 numbers. <clears throat> and standing, kneeling, and on the ground, as we've shown in uh, knife one and other levels. Now we'll have a hooking pummel strike, which is a 12 o'clock hook or anything from above, a three o'clock hook or anything from the right side, a six o'clock hook or anything from below, and a nine o'clock hook or anything from the left side. We switch hands, 12, and three, and six o'clock, and then any nine o'clock hooking strike. With the closed folder, we've drawn the closed folder out, and whether we use it on purpose closed as a support, almost like a brass knuckle strike, but then also uh, we use it as a uh, uh, ridge hand, so to speak, or a strike from the top side of the wrist, and a hammer fist, on the bottom side of the fist. So uh, at times you may draw the knife, not have a chance to open it up, and have to initially fight until you can open up the knife. So, we'll so striking with the top side of the knife, we have a thrust at 12, a thrust at 3, a thrust at 6, and a thrust at 9 o'clock. With a hook, we have a hook at 12. 
topside, hook at three topside, hook at six, and a hook at nine o'clock. We'll do that right and left handed, standing, kneeling, and on the ground. Advanced training is all the numbers on the clock. So just as an example, we have a 12 hook. This, this one o'clock and two o'clock hooks are very popular now in MMA. UFCs have been won by this blasting shot that comes in like a hammer fist that's high. So this is part of your repertoire, uh, is using that area to, if you need to, include it in the uh, advanced 12 version. Now for the bottom side, you've got a, a like a hammer fist, a thrusted above at 12 o'clock, a thrust to the right side at three, a thrust at six o'clock, and a thrust at nine o'clock. We switch hands, 12, and three, and six o'clock, and then nine o'clock. <clears throat> now for a hook, we have a, a hammer fist from, or anything from above uh, from 12 o'clock. Uh, a hammer fist using the, the extended part of the knife to the three o'clock side, anything from the right side. We have six o'clock, we have nine o'clock, we switch hands, we have 12 hook, three hook, six hook, and then a nine o'clock hooking strike. The big five strikes with the closed folder, the brass knuckle five is like what we like to call it, you know. If I'm in this lead, the right lead, you have a jab, a cross, a hook, an uppercut, I step off slightly for the descending overhand, which strikes here, it doesn't strike anywhere else, it strikes here and goes down. Since I'm now in this lead, you can put the closed folder in this hand so that this side experiences the jab, the cross, the hook, the uppercut, you step forward at the descending overhand shot.